Uh, well, um, the, the quick and dirty on that is that, yeah, the, the automotive formulating tradition, if you will, um, predates that of uh, a lot of the industrial lubes uh, formulating tradition. So they, you know, the industrial lubricant formulation specificity really didn't start to evolve until the 1940s or 1950s. You know, I, I actually had some of the pleasure to, to meet people who are way older than me when I was, uh, before I had any of this gray hair, uh, who were sort of the beginners of uh, that bifurcation around World War II times of uh, very specific industrial lubes. And industrial lubes at that time, you know, in the 30s and 40s, 1930s, 1940s timeframe, they were very simple lubricants. They, they were essentially just lightly additized base stock for very specific uh, applications. And uh, the automotive world, as it were, had a chance to evolve specifications and make a lot of mistakes and break a lot of machines. And usually when there's a, uh, a lot of uh, failures in a mechanical device or in a very specific type of mechanical design, that tends to drive specifications, right? And you'll see that with the automotive specifications. They look very odd compared to the very large uh, machinery that that uh, is common to industrial lubricants today. You know, the, uh, the, there's the the famous saying: you have to be careful of the loose nut behind the wheel. And uh, that that <laughs> that really goes back to <laughs> worrying about the the driver problem, right? In industrial settings, you don't have you, you rarely have a, an errant driver. Usually, that's the guy that's about to be fired. But in the automotive sector you have to formulate to the least common denominator, right? The, the least competent driver, the, the, the most abusive roadway, the uh, lowest uh, design quality gearbox and drivetrain systems, right? So that's really what a lot of things like the sulfur phosphorus chemistry that you see. So there's people who talk about EP type of additives you know, that's a heavily sulfurized oil fins that, you know, essentially just prevent shock loading type of damage. You don't tend to worry about that in, in high quality industrial gear. Um, yet, you know, you could just, I'm, I'm sitting here in St. Louis and there's a road not too, a principal highway, probably about a quarter mile away. And I can hear people stopping and starting and screeching and trucks zooming up and down. And those are all like normal, operations of you know speed load changes all the time right so you could you could sort of understand why the, the automotive sector even though the, the the overall loads are 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 lower if you will compared to the industrial uh, type of application um but the 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 operational environments continue have for over 100 years and continue to be today very abusive environments even in mild temperature conditions and then layered on top of that, you've got, you know, the <clears throat> the guy in Saskatchewan in January. He's got to try and get get his truck moving at negative 40 C. And if he's got to make a delivery down to Key West three days later, right? He's got to worry about high humidity and you know plus 30 C. You know, so there's that 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 really odd. Uh, uh, overlay of performance demand environment that goes into the automotive sector and that 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 sort of tradition that they came out of which is when when you really think about it do you re really need dispersants and detergents all that much in an automotive gear oil because they're there to manage combustion um, byproducts from hydrocarbons the, you know free radicals the, the acids the bases the nitrates the sulfides you know, th those are the things that you don't see in industrial setting, and you really don't see those in an automotive gear oil, but those, that tradition of formulating sort of still carries on through today. If you look at the chemistry that goes into a, an automotive gear oil, a lot of it doesn't really need to be there, but I think there's, there's so many specifications that are built up over so many decades that you're never going to move those out of the way. Is that, mm. that, that, finite chance that oh, I really don't know if I take this out of the, the formulation is I'm really going to have a problem. 
right? So, and that that's the that's the issue. You've got industrial lubricants. You, you have the luxury of uh, 10, 50, you know, 20, maybe 30,000 users of a specific type of gearbox, right? But in the automotive arena, you've got millions of users of, you know, there's a, there was a body camp that was done on a, um, uh, uh, one of these car and driver magazines I was reading about a month ago where they, they, they counted up, there's over 1,100 different cars that are available in the U.S. for sale, brand new. And then you've got, you know, the, the fleet that's on the road is anywhere from 11 to 15 years old. And you've got antique cars and you've got, you know, hybrid cars. So, you've, you know, you, you, you think about how many cars rotate in and out of just the North American fleet. It could be as many as... 15 million every year coming and going out of what's on the road. And then there's, you know, 30 different species of mechanical applications. So I, I, I get it why the automotive sector is, is heavily additized and very conservative and hungover because they, they have to formulate to a, a, the loosen up behind the wheel. That's, that's really the bottom line. If you found this content useful, head on over to lubrication.expert. It's a website where there's tons more training courses, they're more structured, and it's available for about 22 US dollars a month.